This is a cyclocrane, a hybrid airship built in the early 1980s by my father and me and about 30 others intended for ultra heavy vertical lift. That's me, I'm Rob Crimmins and I'm standing next to some of the internal structure. That's my father, the inventor of the cyclocrane, Arthur George Crimmins Jr. Each flight began by rolling the airship out of the hangar. This hangar is in Tillamook, Oregon, and it's one of the few in the world large enough to assemble the cyclocrane. The project started in Delaware and Maryland, and we moved to Tillamook in 1981 to complete the assembly. The door opening is 125 feet tall, which gave us five feet of clearance. Once we got the airship outside, we'd put the lower cab on a truck and haul it out to the airport to the west. Here's the lower cab and you see Bill Giordano, the flight engineer, looking at the camera now, which I was operating. And with him is J.J. Morris, our pilot. J.J. is a retired Army colonel and a helicopter pilot. Dad was aboard on all the flights on this video, and there are several. And I flew on the first flight, which was a tethered flight. But on all the flights after that, I stayed on the ground, either supervising the ground crew or shooting the video. Eventually, attracting investors became a crucial activity, and video was the most important outcome of the flight test. Then, all I did during the test was shoot video, and Chris Wegener supervised the ground crew. So every flight was started with letting the balloon rise until it lifted the lower cab off the truck and then letting everything rise until the sling load cable was tight on whatever payload we were carrying. On one or two flights we carried some logs, on another flight we carried a logging chain, on one flight we carried a uh, Volkswagen bus because that was a real payload that people could relate to. So once the balloon got up to the right height, a couple hundred feet, the payload would be secured and the lower engine would be started. And when it got warmed up, the stalk assembly, which is that blue blade and the red wing, the engine would be rotated 90 degrees to start the airship center body into rotation. The cyclocrane gets its name from the arrangement of the rotating airfoils, which is a cycloidal rotor. We refer to the blue airfoils as blades because they functioned as the blades of a propeller to pull the cyclocrane through the air. The red airfoils on the ends of the blades, or the wings, of the cycloidal rotor. Those two components together were an assembly that we called the stalk. The lifting gas, either helium or a helium-hydrogen mixture, supports the weight of the airship and half the payload. So when it was unloaded, it is highly buoyant, which meant that ballast isn't necessary. The need to add or remove ballast is why blimps and rigid airships are impractical for heavy lift. The cyclocrane didn't have to take on ballast after it released its sling load. It used the force generated by the wings to either lift half the payload or hold the ship down when it is unloaded. Every flight begins by letting the ship rise until it is lifting half the payload, then starting the engines to rotate the center body. When he's ready, the pilot used the controls, which were the same as they are for helicopters, to change the angle of attack of the wings through each rotation to lift the rest of the load. To fly to his destination, he would command the stalks to rotate slightly forward, causing them to function as a propeller. In Hover, the original two-ton sling-load cyclocrane, which we finished in 1982, would have rotated at 13 revolutions per minute, which produced a relative wind over the wings of 60 miles per hour. 
As the ship's forward speed increased, rotation would decrease until the ship was making way at 60 miles an hour, at which point it wouldn't be rotating at all, so it would corkscrew through the air. During some of the flights, we trailed ribbons from the ends of the stalks so that you could tell the ship was rotating in the still photography. As the ship was approaching its destination, it would wind back up again, go back into hover, set the load down, release it, and continue to rotate to hold the ship down against 2,000 pounds of aerostatic lift. This ship is not the original two-ton slingload cyclocrane, which we started building in 1980. That model was destroyed in a storm before we could fly it on October 22, 1982, a date which is still referred to in our family and by some of the crew as Black Friday. We had erected a very massive and strong mooring mast fashioned from a 100-foot logging tower. On October 9th, we took the ship outside and fastened it to the mast in anticipation of the first flight. There was still work to do, and while we were attending to those final tasks, a storm moved in from the southwest. The forecast was for winds that we would have withstood, but at about 10 o'clock in the morning, a squall line on the back side of the storm, with winds over 90 miles an hour, tore the ship from the mast. It crashed in a field about a quarter mile north. I don't know how many of us believed him, but that afternoon, Dad told us we would rebuild it. It took two more years, almost to the day, but the rebuilt cyclocrane is what you see here. The main differences between the two are the ring tail, the telemetry system, and the number of engines. The first model had four engines, and the second one had two. You can see some of the repairs in this shot. The panels that are lighter than the others on the aerostat were ones that were replaced. I was 24 when I started working on the cyclocrane and 29 when we flew it. My title on the business card read project manager and I did do a little office work but I was really a machinist and a rigger. Chris Wegener, Steve Schelfer and I did most of the assembly in the hangar. They were younger than me and the work was best done by young men. We climbed around the rafters and wiggled through the confined spaces every day so we needed to be agile and tough. Steve's job interview included a pull-up demonstration, and being fresh out of the Marine Corps, he passed that pretty easily. Work inside the ballonet and on the hull was done from bosun's chairs, and by the time the assembly was complete, we had rigged 26 falls to the hangar ceiling to lift the ship and to carry us to pieces of it. The three of us did the hardest physical work, but we were by no means the only people on the crew that worked hard. It was my father who inspired us, and I believed in him. But I was not the only one who followed his example or gained his approval. That process began with Bob Kaufman, who was the first to join the project after my mother. His skills and personality complemented Dad's and Don Doolittle's, the chief engineer. Bob was a board draftsman and an illustrator, which were pre-CAD era skills needed to turn the designs into parts and the big ideas into presentations. 
Bob also had a great sense of humor, which was the first thing I noticed about him. The characters in the flyer that he drew for an event in 1982 reflect his playfulness, but he was serious about the project and an important member of the team. Daniel Gumier was a young French engineer who worked for Farrick, the Forest Engineering Research Institute of Canada. His primary role was to monitor our work and progress for the Canadian investors, but what he really did was help Don Doolittle design the cycle crane, and his work in that area was very important. Don was Dad's partner and the originator of the whole balloon with wings concept. He invented the aero crane when he and Dad worked for All-American Engineering in Delaware. The cycle crane was a variation on that idea. I joined the project about the time Danielle did in 1980, when the shop was in Don's garage in Bosman, Maryland. We had a lathe and a milling machine, and Dad taught me how to operate them. It was a great way to learn the trade. Dad would show me how to make a part, and then I'd make the rest of them. Most of the components were multiples of four, and some were in many multiples of four. So by the time I finished any set, I really knew how to do it. When we got to Tillamook, we hired two machinists to pick up where Dad and I left off. Frank McNair was a gregarious and highly skilled master machinist from Ottawa, and Ken Kipke was an Oregon native with considerable experience making components for heavy machinery used in sawmills and logging equipment. Ken was a very colorful and passionate character who was one of those guys who knew a lot about something and a little about almost everything. Hunter Harris was a commercial pilot and a and mechanic, who joined us after we moved from the office and shop on Don's property to a much larger block building in Bosman adjacent to the house that Dad and my mother rented. Hunter was as well-rounded as Ken. I'm the most excited I've ever been in my life. <laughs> We've been working at this for so long, and at last, just to see with the, with the blue sky behind it instead of in the hangar, it's just wonderful. <laughs> my mother's role in the whole affair was as important as anyone's, except Dad's. She stood by him throughout it all with emotional and material support. Her career before the cycle crane was as an accountant, so she handled all those matters for the company. The emotional part is now a burden for her, and she won't even talk about the cycle crane. Hunter recommended Chris Wegener, who turned out to be a very valuable member of the team, and he is still my friend. Chris and I worked side by side during the most trying times on the most difficult tasks, including that awful week after the crash when we took the cycle crane apart in order to start over, and when we spent five days wearing breathing equipment while repairing a 24-foot tear in the ballonet. We both nearly suffocated and had to be rescued at the very beginning of that ordeal. Hunter also recruited Ted Wilkbank while we were still in Maryland. Ted came to Oregon with us, and worked with Dale Williams from ILC Dover, the envelope manufacturer, on that extremely important aspect of the project. It's, uh, you know, to look at it, you'd think, well, it's a balloon, you know, there's not much to it, but it's, it's uh, really a, a very technical device, and, and uh, we just have to fine-tune it now. Bill Giordano, who was aboard the cycle crane on every flight that Dad and I were a part of, was a friend of mine from Delaware. And so was Art Reagan, who was from New Jersey. Art and Bill were electronics techs, 
and Bill was an excellent electrical and electronics engineer. It was because of his very wide-ranging knowledge and innate intelligence that he became an indispensable part of the flight crew and design team. The women on the team, in addition to Joan Crimmins, my mother, included Bill's wife Diane, a computer specialist, Karen Maas, whose husband Reggie was an employee, and Mary Priss, dad's assistant. Mary was very professional and efficient with a great attitude about almost everything except cigars. When my son Patrick was born and all the men were smoking, she was not pleased. Which brings me to my wife Judy, whose support then and now is the best thing in my life. There were very few power plant or airframe matters that Roger Wesselman couldn't handle. And Lars Radistam is another member of the crew I have to mention. Lars was as smart as Dad and Bill, and unlike Dad or Bill, Lars had an extensive formal education. I loved working with Lars, mostly because of his work ethic, but also because of his knowledge, generosity, and his accent. His Swedish accent, along with his sense of humor, and his stories about his childhood in Scandinavia and his father, the sea captain, made Lars a pleasure to be around. The people of Tillamook were sort of members of the crew, too. They helped us from the very first day. I really never known such generosity and kindness, and there's one man in the family that represents the whole town in that respect, the Churchills. David, his mother Dorothy, and especially her husband George. They and others helped every time it was needed. George was a very special man in a town that has a lot like him. If Dad were writing this, he would praise others in addition to those I've named, probably investors and others who participated in ways that I was unaware of. He might also mention those who forced him off the project, but fortunately for them, I'm not interested in their legacy. It hasn't had much lasting importance, but we did a pretty remarkable thing. Several of us turned it into careers, and that's a positive outcome. The investors would disagree, but otherwise no one got hurt. So I'll stick with the adage about the journey being more important than the destination and be satisfied with the memories and pictures of a good trip. <laughs>